Welcome back to Matt Presents. Last week I did David Cronenberg triple feature, and let's just get right into it. So I started with The Dead Zone from 83, I believe. It was, uh, I was kind of torn between this and Dead Ringers. Um, two very good David Cronenberg films. Uh, I, I actually... <laughs> I was indecisive to the point of running a Twitter poll. This, I think, is a better movie night movie. It's more fun, it's more of a crowd pleaser, it's a little cheesy, whereas Dead Ringers is, like, weird and not super easy to follow. Although, the shit I've shown on this show so far is already so fucking weird. Dead Ringers wouldn't stand out. It would. It wouldn't be so far removed from what I've already shown. But I, I do think this is the more fun of the two. I Dead Ringers is the better of the two. For talking about better movies, definitely Dead Ringers. I also have a much nicer Blu-ray. This is kind of a crappy DVD. It does what it needs to, you know. The Dead Zone, based on uh, a book by Stephen King. You'll see Stephen King's name in big, bold letters. Bigger than The Dead Zone, in fact. It, it's Stephen King, The Dead Zone. <laughs> like, Stephen King gets higher billing than anyone involved in this movie. Which, uh, in 93, that kind of made sense. I mean, Christopher Walken and Martin Sheen are both, you know, stars, so they deserve some credit. But it made sense in 83 that Stephen King got higher billing than Cronenberg. Cronenberg wasn't that big in America, at least in 83. This was sort of his, uh... This helped push him, push him into the mainstream, you know? But uh, th this, this DVD came out in, like, 2006, like... Wouldn't you want to, like, advertise that this is a Cronenberg movie? You know, well-known, very well-known director David Cronenberg worked on this movie. Also produced by, uh, Deborah Hill, who wrote the original Halloween with John Carpenter. Um, very famous horror producer. Um, no credit for Christopher Walken. There's his picture, but... Other than that, no credit for Christopher Walken, no credit for Martin Sheen. Uh, Dead Zone is the story of a man who... It's a uh, story of a teacher who gets in a car wreck with an 18-wheeler carrying, I think, nuclear waste? It might have just been gasoline, but I'm pretty sure it was nuclear waste. And after that, he goes into a coma for like five years. And when he wakes up, he has psychic powers. He can, like, touch your hand and, and see... Weirdly, both your past and your future. Um, like, he can see if some bad thing is about to happen to you. And he can see if some bad thing has happened in your past. So he, he discovers this when a nurse touches him and he sees that her house is about to catch on fire... And he's like, you gotta go home, you gotta save your kid, there's still time. And then he he reveals to like a doctor that the doctor's mother is still alive, and he he helps these cops solve a murder case. But but he gets tired of kind of the reputation this gives him among his community, so he moves to a different town where no one knows who he is. Uh and spend some time there, but eventually, you know, the visions come back to him. He, he sees that, like, one of the kids he's tutoring is gonna fall into the ice along with his whole hockey team. Um, and then he meets Martin Sheen. Th that's, like, all that other stuff is, like, the first, like, half, maybe even two-thirds of the movie. And then, like, in the very last bit of the movie... He meets Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen is running for president. Uh, it's a prequel to Westworld. Or, 
alternate timeline to Westworld. Uh, he meets Martin Sheen, who wants to be president, but when he shakes hands with Martin Sheen, he sees that once Martin Sheen becomes president, he's gonna cause a big nuclear war that's gonna kill off a lot of, if not all of, humanity. So, in order to prevent that, he sets out to assassinate uh, Martin Sheen before he can become president. Um, of course, you know, he shows up and he takes a shot at Martin Sheen and misses. And Martin Sheen just, like, grabs a baby and uses a baby as a human shield. And so because of that, he loses the election. So, because everyone's like, oh, what a, what a dick, he used a baby to defend himself against a shooter. So, so Christopher Walken didn't even have to kill him, he just ruined his reputation. <laughs> Weird movie, interesting movie. Uh, overall, I like it. There are glaring issues, <laughs> like, more so than most of Cronenberg's movies. Um, because... I don't know, Cronenberg's got some camp to him, but this is, this is a little silly. A little silly. Like, uh, the, the murderer they track down, he's been, like, stabbing women with a pair of scissors. He's been killing women with scissors. Which, for some reason, was, like, a trope in slasher movies in the 80s. I don't know how easy it would be to kill someone with a pair of scissors. I'm not saying you couldn't do it. I'm just saying it'd be a lot more difficult than 80s horror makes it out to be. And it's definitely harder than, uh, <laughs> the fucking serial killer. It's like once the cops have discovered him, because uh, the killer is a cop, so once he's been discovered as the killer, he, like, like, sets up the scissors on, like, his counter, and then, like, slams his head into it to commit suicide like dude just stab yourself just stab yourself because the way he does it if if you actually like threw your head at those scissors they would just fall on the ground it might hurt you might stab yourself a little but you couldn't kill yourself like that so that's a little silly also um I mean there's the weird pacing of like the, the real meat of the film is him trying to stop Martin Sheen, and that's, like, the very end of the movie. But, uh, the, the part where he... He sees that the kid is gonna fall into the ice with his hockey team, and he tells the kid's dad, like, hey, you can't do this. You cannot go through with this hockey team. Um, and afterwards he touches the kid again and doesn't see anything... But it's revealed later that the father still intends to have the hockey game. It's just that the kid refuses to go. The kid won't go to the hockey game because he's worried he's going to fall through the ice. And they never reveal if the other kids fall through the ice or not. I assume so. That's what the movie implies, but they never tell us whether that happened or not. Because, of course, that, that sort of sets up the title where... Christopher Walken says he, he can't see events in a person's future if that person isn't there for them or something. So that's his dead zone. His dead zone is like he can't see the bad things that that person won't experience. Very 80s with the plot about someone starting a nuclear war. Um, though, you know, big concern, height of the Cold War... It's when, uh, it's when Reagan was getting into office. It's always while I'm recording. It's always while I'm recording. Someone's making some loud noise right outside my apartment. Recording or sleeping. Those are the times you make loud noises. So one of the weird things about this is, like, Cronenberg has said before he's, like, very strictly atheist. So he refuses to have anything supernatural in his movies. You know, there's no ghosts, no magic, you know, it all has a scientific explanation. 
and I don't know how much this movie follows that rule, there's a little lip service paid to the fact that maybe this has happened to other people, but there's no scientific explanation for why Christopher Walken can sudden, suddenly has psychic powers, you know? Um, that... <laughs> That feels a little outside of the parameters he has set for himself. To be fair, it's based on a Stephen, Stephen King novel, so, um... He, he didn't have that much input on the source material. Uh... I, I will say... Um... Because Stephen King, also very openly atheistic, um... There is discussion of God and whether or not this power is, like, some gift or a curse or whether or not this is a good thing, whether or not the Lord has bestowed this upon him. But, um, still feels a little supernatural. Still still feels outside the realm of science, you know? I don't know. Fun movie. I enjoy it. Um, not my favorite Cronenberg film. Probably on the lower end of Cronenberg films. Although I'd still recommend it. I, I like most of his movies. We'll talk about his filmography when we get to the end of this. After that, we watched Scanners. Uh, probably... Probably his second most well-known film. Maybe third. May, maybe Videodrome is more popular. I don't know about that one. Um, probably his second most famous. The, the Fly being undoubtedly his most popular. I did watch The Fly. I did enjoy The Fly. Um, probably a little more than Scanners or Videodrome. We'll get to it. So, Scanners is the story... I think it's supposed to be set in the future, but also maybe it's set in the 80s? I couldn't tell. I couldn't figure that part out. Um... Scanners is the story of these, uh, this, this small group of people, there's about 200 or so of them, uh, that have these psychic powers, they can read minds, they can control people's minds, and they can, like, hurt people with their brains, and... This one company... Fuck, I don't even remember the name of the company. So this company, um... Has been... Has this program where they've been trying to... Recruit scanners to work with them. That, that's what they're called. The, the people with the brain powers. They're scanners, and... Um... This company wants the scanners to work with them in their scanners program... Um, one of the doctors has developed this drug that helps repress their powers because they they talk in the movie, a lot, a lot of them talk in the movie about how they can hear other people's thoughts and they, all the time, they can't stop it. They just constantly hear everyone's thoughts. So the this drug will help them not hear people's thoughts and that that's a relief to most of them but uh they keep losing scanners in this program to an underground army of scanners led by Michael Ironside um Michael Ironside either converts them or he just kills them so almost none of the scanners are working for this company anymore they're all on Michael Ironside's team. There are a few that are unaligned, but most of them are either with Michael Ironside or with this company. Um, but then, you know, it's revealed later that secretly Michael Ironside's people have been working with this company. And in fact, it was this company that helped create the scanners. Like, uh, this, this company developed this birth control, and it didn't work. It, it didn't stop 
children being born. So it didn't work as birth control, but all the children that were born when their mothers were on this drug became scanners. So that's the origin of the scanners in this in this series in this film. It is it is a series. We'll talk about that. I love this movie. This is super fun. This is so much fun. <laughs> lots of lots of fun deaths. Lots of car chases, lots of explosions. It's great. I love it. I love that it's in the Criterion Collection. I think the Criterion Collection has this really unfair stereotype as, like, stuffy, art house, classic movies, like, like TCM Vault. Not that I dislike TCM. I like TCM a lot. But I think it's an unfair stereotype on the Criterion Collection. Because they have so many great genre movies. Scanners. This is a B-movie. This is a Canadian B-movie. You know how Scanners got made? In the 70s and 80s, Canada would offer tax exemptions on films. Any movie made, you could write the whole budget off as a tax write-off. So, like, a shit ton of movies got made in Canada. Um, just because it was, it was so cheap to make movies there. You needed a Canadian director and a predominantly Canadian cast. Which is why Michael Ironside's in a lot of these. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, cheap horror movies. A lot of really fun creative horror movies. But cheap horror movies made... In Canada around this time. And that's how Cronenberg got his start. He did... He did Rabid. He did The Brood. And then he did Scanners. Um... And... You know... The acting's not great. The acting's kind of stilted. It's a... I mean, that's what... It's a B-movie. It's a, it's a goofy, cheesy, fun B-movie. That's not to discount it as, like... It does have meaning... It is going for something. It is a smart film. It deserves its place in the Criterion Collection. But, you know, it's... It's not a stuffy art house film. It's a goofy, fun genre movie. No, it wasn't this one. It was this one. There's a, a bonus feature on the Videodrome Blu-ray from Criterion. It's an interview with David Cronenberg, John Carpenter, and John Landis. It's like, that's not an art house crew. That's fun horror genre movie crew. There aren't any there. There aren't any John Carpenter movies in the Criterion Collection. Nor do I. I don't think there's any John Landis films either. There should be. There should be John Carpenter and John Landis films. Although I think Shout Factory owns most of John Carpenter's films. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's just unfair to, to, to stereotype the Criterion Collection like that. Because they've got, you know, Cronenberg movies. They've got, you know, the Jigoku and Haosu I showed last week. They had, uh, you know, like Eyes Without a Face and, and Eating Raul and tons of other great genre movies. It's, it's not just the boring, stuffy dramas, you know. They do have some boring movies. They do have some... They have some good dramas, but they also have a lot of boring dramas. Scanners did spawn follow-ups. There there was... A, for like a decade later. A decade later, there was Scanners 2. Not directed by Cronenberg. Then there was like Scanners 3. And then... The one I'm actually really interested in is a film called Scanner Cops. Which I'm pretty sure is like a sequel to this. But it could very well be um, like a ripoff. A kind of unofficial spinoff called Scanners Cops. We might, we might be looking at those. We might be looking at some of the Scanners sequels. Might might be worth looking into. I don't know that much about the sequels. 
Scanners. Scanners is great. Uh, comes highly recommended by me. I love Scanners. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry it took me so long to watch it. And then I watched Videodrome. <sighs> what a weird fucking movie. I say that every week. I say that every week. <laughs> I feel like I've reached a level... I've, I've set a pace for how weird these movies are going to be that I'm not going to be able to maintain. Like... Like, we've exceeded my threshold for, like, consistently doing movies this weird. Um, I say that. One of the movies I'm going to recommend this week is the weirdest movie I've ever seen. But be warned, <laughs> this show will not continue to be this weird. At some point, it's going to level out. At some point, we're just going to be watching, like, slashers and action movies. And it's going to be fun and not that weird. But this week, I recommended Videodrome, so we're going to talk about Videodrome. <laughs> kind of backed the wrong horse in this movie all the all the footage is shot on Betamax all the like tapes the character has are Betamax tapes which he's in television so Betamax might have been the television standard for a while I could probably ask my dad he worked on he worked on television in the 80s um but Betamax was a little nicer a little nicer looking than VHS. It just was a lot less convenient as a consumer product. But I, I appreciate that there's now a, a Blu-ray designed to look like a Betamax tape. That's very funny to me. I like this better than the cover. <laughs> I mean, it's a good cover. I like the cover, but... It's a Betamax tape. Ooh, I got a Blu-ray Betamax tape. Oh, my, my dad started working in television in the 90s, not the 80s. By the 90s, it might have been out. I'll ask anyway. So, Videodrome stars good old James Wood. God damn. He's such a good actor. Why does he have to be an asshole? <sighs> Fuck James Wood. But also, he's such a good actor. He's such a good actor. Ah, <laughs> uh, heartbreaking. So, stars James Wood. Um... He works for this television station that shows, you know, like, weird, gross, freaky outsider stuff, because no one else will, you know, he's, he's, he's a smaller station, so he's trying to provide something to his audience that the bigger stations won't. I, I think that's a very interesting concept. He starts getting these transmissions from South America for Videodrome and he's recording them with plans to put them on TV but uh, the Videodrome movies are cursed? I don't know what the fuck's wrong with them but they they start making weird stuff happen like <laughs> I can't explain it. I can't explain it. I don't know what happened. I need to watch this movie again, like, immediately after watching it. It starts giving him hallucinations. He starts having hallucinations after he started watching Videodrome. And that leads to him, like, trying to find the people behind Videodrome. And he gets tangled up in this, like, weird web of conspiracies and they convince him of like like Videodrome is gonna take over the world like Videodrome is, is a sentient thing that is gonna take over the world and he becomes the vessel for their action 
you know, I enjoyed this movie, and now I'm trying to describe it, and I'm like, what the fuck? How do I describe what happens in this movie? Watch the movie. Just watch video drama. Then you'll know what happens. I mean, as much as you can know what happens. I, like... It makes more sense than it. I'm making it sound like it does right now. I'm doing a very poor job explaining this. It's it's not it's not a hundred percent comprehensible, but it is more comprehensible than I am making it sound because I just do not know how to describe what happens in this movie. I enjoyed it. I'll tell you that much. I enjoyed it. I think there's uh some some stuff it's trying to say. Okay, yeah, he's he says they might have used Beta Max, but he was in high school when it was popular, so. They, they used Sony Beta Cam. So. I don't know, maybe Betamax. Betamax was an industry thing. It was an industry decision. R regardless of whether or not VHS won that war, it is accurate to have James Wood's character recording all of this on Betamax and not VHS. That is accurate. That is realistic. More realistic than 90% of this film. Were aliens involved? This would make sense if it were about aliens. But I don't think it was aliens. But it might have been aliens. I don't know. Watch the movie for yourself. That's my advice. Watch, vi watch, watch Videodrome. For yourself. So make an interesting double feature with uh, UHF. That'd be funny. Because this movie's, like, so horrendously fucked up, and that's, like, a Weird Al comedy. But they are broadly about the same thing, just a guy running some tiny indie station that, uh, you know, starts showing weird programming so that they can garner attention. Long live the new flesh. That's... What else can you say? Long live the new flesh. Last week I asked you, what's your favorite Cronenberg movie? Obvious question. Uh, mine's still Naked Lunch. I think Naked Lunch is his best film. Uh, it's... I mean, definitely it's his weirdest. Even weirder than Videodrome, but... It also feels like his smartest. It feels like his most... Put together. His least cheesy... Um, I like, I like Naked Lunch. I recommend Naked Lunch. Highly, highly recommended by me. Let's see what you guys had to say. Gregory House says, My fave Cronenbergs, I'd have to say The Fly, Videodrome, and his earlier works. Uh, Shivers, Rabbit, and The Brood. I've not seen Shivers, I've not seen The Brood. I admitted that last time, I, hadn't, I have not seen The Brood. Um, Rabbit I have seen. And I was kind of surprised how many people said Rabid was their favorite. <laughs> Just like... I don't know. Not to to dump on Rabid. I, it's fun, but it's... I don't know. Rabid, more than any of his films, feels just like a Grindhouse B-movie. Like... You know, I, I can... I'll point to, like, Scanners and... Even Dead Zone. Scanners and Dead Zone... Very silly, very kind of campy, but they're they're smart. There's something to them. I feel like there's not that much to Rabbit. I feel like it's just a goofy, gory grindhouse flick. Um, The Fly, great movie. Love The Fly. Uh, I would probably put it just below Naked Lunch. Lino also uh, admits to being a fan of uh, Cronenberg's earlier works. I can... I, I understand why. I understand the appeal of his earlier works. They're a lot more fun, a lot less... self-serious, you know? <laughs> but, uh... I don't know, I feel like I feel like he really peaked in, like, the... the, the later... In the, like, the middle part of his career, you know, late 80s, early 90s. When he was doing The Fly and Naked Lunch. Um, 
Scanners and Videodrome were both pretty early on, though. I might have gotten this back. No, yeah, Videodrome was 83. And Scanners was 81. So, you know. I, I respect his earlier stuff, but... Uh... I kind of like... I kind of like his, like, mid-career stuff. The only one I would say I, I've seen that I really wasn't that into, and I might get shit for saying this, I wasn't super into History of Violence. I don't, I don't think History of Violence was that great. It also feels very out of character for Cronenberg. Like, I straight up forgot it was a Cronenberg film until I, like, looked up his movies about a week ago. Uh, Henry Kostlick seems to... Does somewhat agree with me? It says to answer the question posted today, I've seen the Fly video drama and scanners in my film class in college, and I love the Fly so much because Jeff Goldblum is a national hero and treasure, who made even the kind of unlovable monster more suited to a Lovecraft antagonist or Kafka's protagonist. Um, yeah, Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum brings a lot to the Fly. Uh, I I think. I, f I feel like other people could be in that role and still make it work, but Goldblum really, really made that role stick, which, you know, I'm talking about these films and it's particularly Scanners. Outside of Michael Ironside, the acting in Scanners is not great. It's all very weird, very stilted. I mean, James Wood, I admitted. I like James Wood <laughs> as an actor. Uh, but Videodrome also has some weird performances in there. Alright, this week we're going to ask a question unrelated to movies. T today's question is, what's the creepiest bug? Very easy question. What, what's the creepiest bug? What is the bug that makes you just your skin crawl, that makes you so uncomfortable? Because tonight we're going to do some bug-related horror movies. I wanted to tone it down. I wanted to show some comedies tonight. Because we've kind of been on a horror binge. We did... I mean, we did the, the three house... We had House... But we paired that with some non-horror movies. And then the House 2, that was a whole horror triple feature. And then there was a Japanese horror triple feature. And then... I don't know. Scanners, I guess, isn't really horror... Maybe a little. But Videodrome and Dead Zone are definitely horror. Um, so we've kind of been doing a lot of horror movies. I want to tone it down with a comedy, but... Extenuating circumstances. We're doing a triple feature of bug movies. Because last week I said I wanted to show you Centipede Horror. So that that's going to be our first film tonight. Centipede Horror. Possibly the weirdest movie I've ever seen. Um... It is on YouTube for free, so that's why I don't feel bad about recommending it. However, uh, just recently, it is up for streaming on Alamo Draft House and American Genre Film Archives website. So, the version on YouTube is very low quality, which to be fair, the film is kind of low quality, so I don't feel like you're missing out on that much if you just watch the YouTube version. Uh, I, I will not think less of you for that. But I, I will recommend that you look up the uh, the uh, Alamo Draft House American Genre Film Archive streaming version, a av version available for streaming. Um, it's, it's A, slightly nicer quality, and B, I just really respect those institutions. Uh, American Genre Film Archive is a nonprofit that archives films, and Alamo Draft House is a great theater. I wish I wish there were another one closer to me. So we're gonna start with Centipede Horror, a Chinese film from the early '80s. Then we're gonna watch Slugs, which I think is the mid '80s. I don't know when it came out. It'll be at the bottom of the screen. And watch Slugs, and then we're gonna end with. Uh, the old universal classic Tarantula, which is the only one of these movies I have a box for, and it's this 
classic sci-fi ultimate collection box set. So those are going to be our, our three bug-related horror movies. Um, and until next time, have a great day.